if you look at Josh Allen, it there is zero chance that Jalen Hurts can get into his neighborhood at some point during his career. Zero chance. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> zero chance. Because you just, I mean, the stats, I, I, I get that, like, they tell kind of one story. But when you just look at those two players, when you, you, you contrast their their physical abilities, I don't think there's really any comparison at all between a guy like Josh Allen and, and Jalen Hurts. The arm talent that Josh that Josh Allen has is just so far superior oh, to, to Hurts. I mean, it's just not even close. And then... some teams still playing in the postseason and we'll touch on that and the birds with our next guest he writes about them all the time in phillyvoice.com one of my hometown guys with us here on bird 365 jk how's your offseason going it's uh the first week or so after the season ends is still very busy typically but uh i think like once we get another week or two out it's smooth sailing from there. How you doing? <laughs> uh, we're doing good, Jimmy. I I don't know about smooth sailing, but yeah, I hear <laughs> right. what you're saying. Smoother sailing. Smoother, ah, smoother good. sailing. Um, so let's start with the weekend because I want to get your thoughts. And everybody jumped in, and you know, after watching uh, that, especially Sunday night, the, sure. the the highlight to it all, and people are saying, "Wow, uh, the Eagles probably aren't that close." Is that how you framed it, or is everybody just overreacting to a great game and sort of recency bias? Yeah, it's a great question. I do think that you look at the quarterback position, and I think they're pretty far away from what Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen are, you know, are bringing to the table. You look at the NFC, though, and you have a couple of teams that are, I think, like pretty relevant to the Eagles' conversation with the Rams having traded for Matthew Stafford. They give up a, a you know, Goff and a couple first round picks. Yeah. They bring him in and they're in the NFC championship game. And then you have on the other side of the coin, you know, people that want to make the argument, well, maybe you don't really need a good quarterback to be successful in the NFL, which is sort of a, a, a stance that I couldn't disagree with more, but that's that, you know, idea is sort of emboldened by Jimmy Garoppolo ending up in the NFC championship game with, with the San Francisco 49ers here. So uh, it's sort of an interesting look at, at, at those two teams competing to get into the Super Bowl from those two aspects. Uh, but yeah, like you said, in the, uh, in the AFC, you have teams like, you know, the Bengals under Joe Burrow and you have that, that great game that, that you mentioned with, with uh, Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes. And I don't think the Eagles offense is really uh, close at all to those two teams. I, I, I at the same time, uh, I do sort of agree that, um, it is recency bias, and that game was so far out of control. Yeah, and just the the level of talent and the the level of playmaking in that game really just is sort of um, I don't want to call it an anomaly because those guys are capable of doing that, but it is sort of an extreme example of of sort of the standard that you want to hold yourself up to. Uh, I'm going to go anomaly at least a little bit on yeah. one of the two quarterbacks, and that's Josh Allen. I okay. know that. The week before against the Patriots, he'd been like as good as he was on Sunday. Yeah. So he had back to back, just unbelievably great playoff games. But for the regular season, he was good. He wasn't in the MVP conversation this year. He actually, you can make an argument, took a slight step back from his third season in the league. And I comped out the numbers in their second year between Josh Allen and uh, Jalen Hurts, and they're pretty damn similar. Even this year, Josh Allen, and I use quarterback rating, and I know there are a lot of people that have different metrics that they use. There's no perfect one. We can all agree to that. I think quarterback rating or passer rating is the best of a bad lot. He was 16th in the NFL. Jalen Hurts was 22. There's not that big a difference of them between them in the regular season. Now, Allen had the two postseason games he had, and Jalen had the postseason game he had but I'll kind of chalk that one up for uh, experience. If you look at Josh Allen, it, there is zero chance that Jalen Hurts can get into his neighborhood at some point during his career. Zero chance. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> zero chance. Because you just, I mean, the stats, I, I, I get that, like, they tell kind of one story. But when you just look at those two players, when you you, you contrast their 
their physical abilities. I don't think there's really any comparison at all between a guy like Josh Allen and, and Jalen Hurts. The arm talent that Josh that Josh Allen has is just so far superior yeah, to, to Hurts. I mean, it's just not even close. And then Allen is, CFP you know, he's, he's a former what? That. If not, uh, we'll let him drop and. No, oh, we got. I, okay. I can hear you, Jimmy. Okay, that must be a Jody issue. Keep going. So he's, you know, the eighth overall pick a few years back, and and I think that everyone kind of knew that he would be a guy that might take a little while to to sort of become the quarterback that he is now. I don't think anyone expected that he'd be as good <laughs> right now as, yeah. as as he is. Uh, but you know, he you drafted him. The Bills drafted him on, on the on you know on the premise that he's six five. He's two hundred and forty pounds. He can run, and he's got one of the best arms in the NFL. So. Uh, you know, you look at a guy like Jalen Hurts, who has, you know, some nice positive traits in leadership yeah. ability and tangibles. He can run a little bit. But as far as just a f- from physical ability, he is not anywhere near the same level as Josh Allen, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm on the same page as you with that, Jimmy. And I also add into this because of the, the mobility factor. And you just mentioned Josh Allen's size. And at 6'5", 240, my closest comparison physically would be cam newton sure that he can take sort of punishment but even that he's going to get hurt if he continues to play the way he's playing and i think we said that about jalen hurts this year and people think you're you're talking about season ending injuries torn acls but you saw when he got hurt against the new york giants with the sprained ankle had to completely change his game without the mobility uh in it, and by the way, I think the silver lining and help, helped Jalen a little bit develop as a passer. But long term, it's hard for me to imagine either of these quarterbacks stay healthy for that. Everybody talks about that. We need the quarterback for a decade. Well, if you play like that, you're <laughs> not going to be there for a decade, at least at that level. Fair? Yeah, yeah, you have guys that that run a lot, but they get down, like Russell Wilson didn't miss a game in his career until this year because he didn't take many shots when he ran. He was able to get you know slide and get down. Josh Allen is a horse. He will try yeah. to run through you as opposed to trying to slide and, and avoid you. And Jalen Hurts is kind of a mix of those two things. I think like he'll he'll get hard yards when he has to, but he did a good job, uh, you know, throughout most of the season, I thought, in, in getting down. But the point that you make is a great one in that it's like durability isn't just can you play or not. In the case of Jalen Hurts, where you know he had that ankle injury, he was less effective as a runner, thus sort of sapping him of you know what his appeal is as, as a quarterback. So it's not just you know can you play or can you not play. It's can you sort of alter your game and be something that you're maybe not as good at if you know your best attribute is taken away from you. Do you think? And certainly Jalen ran less than he had up until that point where he turned his ankle. Do you think it was because he realized running was not going to be as productive as it had been? Do you think it was Nick Sirianni's play calling that, hey, we're just not going to call a play for him because you have designated runs. Jalen had them early in the year. I think Allen had at least five of them in the first half against Kansas City on Sunday. It's a planned quarterback's taking off, going to make a play with his legs call. I think he was a lot less of those afterwards. You think that was Sirianni making that call or just Jalen Hurts judging, I can't do this because I'm just not up to it and I want to give my team the best chance to make a play, so he threw it rather than ran it. Yeah, probably a mix of the two because they didn't completely stop uh, calling, you know, run plays that would, like, you know, the, the read option type plays where they didn't, and the the, uh, the RPOs, they didn't stop calling those completely. So Jalen still could, you know, run on some of those plays, <laughs> but uh, I think they did call less of them. And uh, I think that uh, Hertz was, I think, a little bit less willing to to run with the ball uh, late in the season when he was dealing with the, those ankle injuries. Some games, like he looked fine to me, and then other games in the second half, he would look a little gimpy-ish, like <laughs> coming out of those games. So, uh, and then of course, and after the the final, uh, you know, the playoff game, he, he comes into the press conference wearing the walking boot. Uh, I don't know how often he wore that during the season, but that was the first time I think that we saw it in person. But yeah, I mean, I I think that. Uh, uh, certainly during you know during the the last four five six games whatever it was uh, during the regular season we we you know he was limited certainly by that ankle injury and and again going back to John's point you know it's it 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 definitely affected um, you know his uh, effectiveness really uh, as as a quarterback during those last you know half dozen games. 
All right, bigger picture, Jimmy. I want to talk to you about how the Eagles will look at that weekend of football. And people argued, hey, maybe getting in as the seventh seed wasn't the best thing if you start to think <laughs> right. you're a little bit closer, a little bit bull's gold. On the other hand, if you start thinking, we talked a little bit about numbers, Jody, talking about passer rating. Well, the Eagles had more explosive plays, they will tell you, than anybody in football. More <laughs> explosive plays somehow because of a weird, unique offense with running game and, you know, they consider whatever it is, 15 yards, an explosive run. Right. It all comes down to defining explosive yeah. play, doesn't but it? They don't look, but they don't look like the Kansas City <laughs> no. Chiefs. So no. how does – do they overreact? Do they say, oh, we – we you know, nobody's under oath in a press conference. They said we're going to move forward with Jalen Hurts, but if, if other avenues open – they can go down that direction. Is there any overreaction to what happened over the weekend as far as, oh, we got we to gotta move in a different direction? Maybe. Um, I was So the, the one thing that, that struck me during, and this is nothing new from Howie, but the one thing, the one answer that he gave that, that I thought was interesting was um, he said, you know, we don't want to just be getting into the playoffs. We want to be getting – you know, the first round by in the playoffs. And that's nothing. No, he's said that before. I, yeah. I, I think he either said it before the year they actually did get the number one seed or, or after whatever, whenever it was. Uh, but that's a great point. Like you, you want to, you want to get these home games in the playoffs. And if you can, you know, get that first round by in the one seed. And to do that, I think you have to have, you know, an elite back. So Howie uh, and, 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 were very emphatic that uh, Jalen Hurts was their starter in 2022, uh, more emphatic than I thought they needed to be. Uh, I don't know if that was sort of by design or not, but uh, I, I don't think that they're going to sort of turn um, turn their nose up at you know any potential uh, uh, opportunities to acquire an elite type of or near elite type of quarterback like a Russell Wilson, for example, uh, if uh, if a reasonable uh, deal you know pr sort of presents itself. Um, but in terms of overreaction to, you know, the events of, of this past weekend, um, I think it really more than anything just sort of reinforces the, the importance of, uh, of the, of, of the quarterback position in the NFL. Cause if you have one, you have a chance. And if you don't, then you really have to, you know, win. You block a punt. You got to block weird field ways. Goal. You gotta, yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you, yeah. you have to have like a stellar defense, which, yeah. which they don't have right now. So I, I think that the, the, the easiest path or the the quickest path uh to becoming closer to those teams is to acquire a, a top level quarterback like that and then hope that you can build around him over time jimmy i uh, saw yesterday on your site phillyvoice.com your three free agents who make sense for the eagles version one now we've got about uh three and a half weeks before free agency kicks in so We'll be waiting on version two and three and four and five and six. And I do like the way you did it. You didn't just move to the top, the <laughs> highest ranking guys yeah. <laughs> that are going to make the most money at positions. Eagles definitely had needs. You just said, eh, these are guys that, hey, if they end up with the Eagles, I'd see a nice fit there. How did you come up with the three guys that you decided to put into version one? Yeah, I was looking for like medium priced type of players. You know, I wasn't going Devonte Adams, of course. Uh, but yeah, I, th I think this year they're gonna be, you know, more, uh, active in free agency than they were a year ago when they were in cap hell. And, um, you know, I think that the one position that I think makes the most sense for them in, in free agency this year, maybe not the most sense, but makes a lot of sense is wide receiver. And you look at the big swings that teams have taken in free agency at wide receiver over the last decade or so. And it's ugly. Like, I mean, these teams pay a lot of money for wide receivers and it doesn't go well. So I think that the smart thing to do is sort of go after, you know, sort of these mid-tier receivers that aren't going to kill you financially. I think like, like Alshon Jeffrey, when they were able to get him for, what, seven or eight million or yeah. for one year or whatever one it was, year. when they signed him in, I guess it was 2016, um, they, he was a good signing 2017, for them. He guaranteed 2017. the Super Bowl. Oh, right. Everybody that's laughed right. at him. That's right. And, that's right. Go, and he went out and won the Super Bowl. <laughs> so, yeah, I think if you can get a guy like that around that price point, that makes a lot of sense. And the guy that I sort of landed on was DJ Chark from the uh, Jaguars. Of course, the Eagles have a connection there with uh, Dave Caldwell, uh, who joined their their per, their front office staff. Uh, they After he joined their staff in May, they traded for Gardner Minshew. They traded for a cornerback and Josiah Scott. 
who both came from the Jaguars. So uh, I think he's already had a little bit of an influence in terms of uh, their their acquisitions. And Chark makes sense to me because he's got some speed. He's six yeah. four, so he's got some size that their other receivers don't have. Uh, ha- made the Pro Bowl a couple years ago. Uh, in I believe it was 2019 and 2020, his number suffered a little bit because his, his quarterbacks went from Minshew to a guy named Jake Luton to <laughs> Mike Glennon, <laughs> and he still put up over 800 yards. So he's, he's still produced anyway. Last year, uh, he, this year rather, he he broke his ankle, only played in four games. So I think he's sort of like an under the radar kind of guy that that you can get for a reasonable price and can perform. So he was that. It was my guy for that. And then Rashad Penny, the uh, the running back from from the Seahawks, I think makes some sense. Again, another guy that's just been killed by injuries over the course of his career. Yeah. You look at his last five games of this year. He had like over six hundred and fifty yards, very great. quietly. Nobody noticed yeah. because the Seahawks were their their season was in the toilet at that point. But he like totally blew up at the end of the year. The Eagles yeah. had him in for a pre-draft visit uh, back in 2018 when, when he was coming out in the draft. So I think he's a guy that, that makes sense as a power runner who can maybe allow you to get more young, a little younger and more explosive than what you have in, in a guy like Jordan Howard. And then the third guy was um, uh, Uchana Nuoso uh, from, from the Chargers. That's maybe a little bit of a higher swing. Like he's not going to be you know, he's not going to be low priced. You're going to have to shell out some money for him. But the Eagles need pass rusher help. And he's not your typical, you know, uh, pan in the dirt defensive end. But he is a guy that can play that Sam position and would be an upgrade, in my opinion, on a guy like Gennard Avery in terms of uh, pass rushing ability, coverage ability and against the run. So I think if you bring in a guy like that, then you pri- either that position becomes a lot more important in your defense. And, of course, that's sort of dependent on whether Jonathan Gannon returns <laughs> as the Eagles defensive coordinator. Uh, but but if he does, then that's a guy that's you know tailor-made for that Sam spot. I do want to get into you with JG a little bit. But before I yep. do, because the most interesting one to me was Rashad Penny, but for a different reason, because Miles Sanders is one of those guys mm-hmm. where – He's eligible for an extension now. We know the Eagles don't want to pay big money on a second contract or running back. He's been banged up. He had he had the ankle. He had the quad. People forget the quad. Then he had the broken hand this year. The numbers are still great. Five and a half yards per carry. Still not a great pass receiver. Still not a great pass protector. That. It, it, Miles Sanders is a tough decision for this particular team. So is Rashad, somebody like Rashad Penny thinking about 2023 as well and maybe letting Miles Sanders walk away from this organization? Because they don't value the position from a financial, nor should they, by the way. Yeah, they've been smart about that position uh, in terms of not reach, you know, not drafting them super high in, in the draft or, or, or shelling out a lot of money uh, for that position. But you, like you said, like Miles Sanders, you look at his numbers and, and like yards per carry, yeah. they look great. But when you watch the games, he kind of yeah. like leaves you wanting more. Like yeah. you, you miss that hole. You kind of dance in the backfield instead of minimizing the damage on this play, et cetera. And uh, I, I think that. Uh, I think that when you saw the success of a guy like Jordan Howard, when he got his opportunities this year, you saw that it's really not that hard to be an effective running back behind this offensive line. And I think that like, you know, they, they can almost kind of do better than, than Miles Sanders. With the fact that as of now, they're staying put with the quarterback they have, but I love John's phrase of they weren't under oath. They can change their mind. <laughs> right. Do they need to make that decision first? They're having meetings right now. McMullen, McDonald, and Kemsky are meeting on the Eagles and free agency and like, and Eagles are doing the same exact thing. But are you making these decisions dependent upon what you're going to do at the quarterback position? I always think you start a quarterback and then you move through everything else in the team. They do have to try and lay out a game plan for this offseason, and at least they're telling us as of that right now, Hurts is the guy. Are they going to stick that? Or is there a plan B? All right, here's Hurts and everything we got to do. Here's Russell Wilson and everything we got to do. Here's quarterback C and everything else. How do they get prepped and ready to go for free agency, which is now less than four weeks away? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's hard to do because in order to get a veteran quarterback, if that's what you're interested in, it, it takes two to tango. You have to have a, a another team cooperating with you and willing to trade you their quarterback and, and not – 
taking the entirety of your franchise to, to be able to do that. And then if you like a guy in the draft, you're sitting there at picks 15, 16, and 19. There's no guarantee that, you know, you can go up and, and I mean, you have the ammo to do it, I guess, but uh, there, there's, there's no guarantee that you're going to find a team willing to do, to do a reasonable deal for you to move up for, for that kind of guy. So it's hard to formulate a game plan uh, an offseason game plan on the premise that you're going to trade for a quarterback or you're going to draft a quarterback because you don't know whether you can get those guys or not. So they're in kind of a weird situation where if they stick with the guy that they have in place now, you know, theoretically they're going to be running a run heavy offense in 2022, like they did in 2021. Whereas if they go after a different quarterback, like a Russell Wilson or a Kenny Pickett in the draft or whatever it may be, then you're going to probably want to run an offense more, you know, like the one that we saw early in the season that they faltered when they tried to run. So it's kind of tough to really yeah. formulate an offensive game plan until you have that piece in place. And I imagine that one way or the other, they'll be eager to figure that out uh, before, you know, free agency kind of gets going. All right, Jimmy coaching carousel point of the broadcast. And we'll start with a current Eagles coach and a former Eagles coach. Cause I want to get your, thoughts on both Jonathan Gannon and Doug Peterson. It looks like JG is out uh, when it comes to the Denver Broncos. They're down to three finalists. Minnesota's not going to hire him because they just got rid of Mike Zimmer. And the last thing they want is somebody with <laughs> a connection to Mike Zimmer. So <laughs> right. it's probably Houston or bus for JG. There was a lot of whispers like speeding up late last week, but nothing early this week. Where, where do you think JG is with the Houston Texans? And then why in the heck does nobody in this league want Doug Peterson? Yeah, the Doug Peterson question is is really interesting because he got a bunch of interviews like right off the bat. And then seemingly there was no interest after because there was no buzz after after he had those interviews. Like it went well, it didn't go well. You just didn't hear anything about it anymore. And you're not hearing anything about him in like the last week or so. So I don't know that he's getting a job this this hiring cycle. Uh, and if he doesn't get a job this hiring cycle, when's he going to get one? So yeah, really really interesting that that a guy who just won a Super Bowl and won a Super Bowl, he was a big reason why they won a Super Bowl. <laughs> kind of yeah. crazy that uh, that 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 uh, he can't get another. Not job. only that, he JG. changed the whole league, Jimmy, with with the <laughs> yes. uber aggressive. <laughs> And Ryan Paganetti yes. will tell you it's like we we did this. What? Why do we not get credit for it? What? Well, but in in Doug's case, did the Eagles do a number on him on the way out the door? Is is I guess yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah, I think the uh, the whole tank game too didn't help his legacy as well. I think that was sort of a whole ugly incident. One thing I will admit, you mentioned Ryan Paganetti. I thought this was interesting. He Ryan Paganetti. Uh, for those of you who don't know, was the guy in Doug's ear uh, during games, to, you know, sort of advising him on go for it calls, uh, even on third, like third and nine. He'd be like, OK, well, if we get to like fourth and two, then that's a go for it situation, et cetera. Um, after Doug and his staff was like, oh, Paganetti wasn't retained either. Paganetti uh, opened a Twitter account and yeah. would comment on games during games about the analytics and decisions and, and, and so forth. He deleted his Twitter account. A, like a like a week or two ago and this my mind to, immediately went to yeah. oh wow doug doug's gonna get a job somewhere because yeah. he's gonna bring ryan yeah. with him and the, ryan deleted his twitter account and then uh last week or so uh paganetti's twitter account back up <laughs> <laughs> so so i was wondering oh does that mean uh no job for doug, yeah, doug so i just thought that was no, ryan funny. has been on on the show with Has us he? a couple okay. times and yeah. <laughs> yeah, he wants, you know, he wanted to calm it down because he was being very honest. He was a great Twitter follow, you know, because if Doug gets a job, he'll probably bring him in. So it's understandable. Uh, but you're right. I mean, it, it, it's a matter of um, the Eagles had such an impact on it. You see it every week now. I mean, if, if you don't go on fourth and two and you're on the plus side of the field, you get lambasted oh, yeah. on, on social media. <laughs> and yeah. the Eagles were a big part changing the Eagles' thinking. Doug Peterson was a big part of that. Ryan was a big part of it. And we have the same group think in the NFL. It's the same five names, Jimmy. Everybody enters the interviews the first five names, and if they don't get them, then they start trickling down 
to the Nick Sirianni's of the world. Mm-hmm. What, is, is there a problem? People thought, obviously, there's a large problem, disparity in hiring minorities. What is the bigger problem in the NFL? That group think the un- inability to do anything different, to consider anybody else than the guys that are deemed, I like to call them, if you're a Zoolander fan, Hansel, they're the hot candidates right, <laughs> right. now. That, every so year is right the now. same Hansel. thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't answer your Jonathan Gannon question before oh, yeah. about well, the Houston I'll, job, uh, so I'll get to that real quick. But uh, yeah, I, my, I don't know. I don't. I don't cover the Houston Texans, but you know, I'd, be, I'd read often enough that Josh McCown was sort of the favorite for that job. And if it's not him, then it could be Jonathan Gannon. I do wonder if the Eagles would. I mean, there are so many like qualified defensive coordinators that are now kind of free agents at this point. Zimmer, I don't know if uh, that's a great fit, but, um, you know, guys Big like Fangio, Big Fangio yeah. and uh, and Brian Flores, if he doesn't get another head coaching job. Now Wink Martindale's out there. Uh, so I wonder if the Eagles wouldn't mind so much if like Jonathan Gannon got, got a head coaching job somewhere else and, and could maybe view one of those other guys as an upgrade. But Gannon sort of fits the mold of what you're talking about on your next question in terms of sort of off the radar hires, maybe not so much group think because I mean, you look at the Eagles defensive production in 2021, it wasn't great. And uh, the sort of the buzzwords that have kind of gone around about Gannon was that he's smart and he connects with players and uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, I don't know that he, but it's, it's, it is interesting that he got three interviews. So maybe there was a little bit of a group thing going on there. He got one interview and sort of snowballed from there. Uh, but yeah, as far as, uh, the group think goes in the NFL, I do think that, um, you know, old ideas kind of die hard in the NFL and, and it takes a little while for, for new ideas to be, you know, widely accepted and you have to see, you know, sustained success for, for those new ideas to, to sort of get adopted like Doug with the fourth down, go for it situations. And I think that kind of trickles over into the head coaching, uh, you know, hiring process that um, you need to see some teams have uh, success with sort of off the radar hires before you start seeing more teams go down that road. And we, I think we've kind of started to see that a little bit with, with, with some recent hires like, um, uh, like uh, Brandon Staley had a, had a decent year as a first year head coach kind of faltered a little bit down the stretch, but whatever. Um, and then you have, you know, sort of the guys like, uh, like McVeigh and uh, you know, right on down the line. But um, yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see. It's kind of odd to me that no hires have been made at all yet. Normally yeah. you see at least a, yeah. a few by now, but none of them, none of them have, have come down the pike yet. So I'm just kind of in wait and see mode. And, and, you know, in terms of like where these guys sort of land, but the Giants had an interesting thing. I, like, it's always interesting to me, to me when there's a guy I never heard of that gets the head coaching job, and I can't even think of what his name is. Lou, Lou something. The Giants. Don Amiro. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't. Yeah. I don't know who he was. So yeah, it seems like these guys are, are are spreading a little bit of a wider net than they did previously. All right. Since you went there, Jimmy, I want to follow up on something you touched on. And Johnny Mac, if you want to chime in, please do. But I'll start with Jimmy. You mentioned. Tankapalooza last game of the season <laughs> yeah. in Doug's last year and what went down there. And it could actually be having an effect on the way Doug is judged at this point. Everybody worked at you guys at your job on doing it from afar as to how it came down that the unstoppable Nate Sudfeld got into that game. Was it something that was planted as a seed in Doug's head? Was it something that was hammered home in Doug's head? This would be advantageous for a us to lose the game coach was it something that Doug just decided to do on his own because he's a loyal guy and Sudfeld's good in the room and we heard little variations of all the stories uh when it happened give me what you believe the most Kemsky, oh, they tanked. They, 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 yeah, they started tanking that game before that game even began because when the, when the inactives were announced there was like 12 to 14 guys on that list yeah. something there was a wild number of players that they just had inactive for that game and it was like a bunch of like you know their most important players and starters you mean you mean like the last game of this year <laughs> the cowboy exactly exactly like that and then even leading up to that game doug said oh i want to get a look at nate in this game because yeah <laughs> you know he was he he's tried hard all year in practice and he's a good guy and we're going to let him play a little bit too. So they were already greasing the skin. I always get in trouble for this, Jimmy, but it's a great joke. So I'm going to throw it out there. Okay. Again. 
I, they treated Nate like he was a make a wish stick kid, like he hadn't been <laughs> practicing. I get in a lot of trouble for that, but it's like he's an NFL player. I want to see, yeah, they treated yeah. him like. Um, and it wasn't like Hertz was playing poorly in that game when they pulled him. Uh, he was at least keeping them in it. And then as soon as Sudfeld came in, like, it was, well, he was just... playing poorly, but I think Washington was playing. Remember, he missed yes. the throw in the end zone. Washington was playing so poorly. Um, I think they were surprised they were in the game. And at that <laughs> yes. point, it was so obvious. They, they just thought they were going to get rolled over. But I asked Jalen after the game if he knew he was – and he said yes. He knew he was getting taken out of the game. Yeah. So, yeah, the Eagles the Eagles definitely tanked it. But I don't know. Who who cares? <laughs> how, he's up in, how he's up in the box going, come, come on, Washington. Yeah. Exactly. We're doing everything to get you into the playoffs, you bums. Come on, take yeah. this game already. And they just wouldn't do it. By the way, Jimmy, it is Lou Anarumo, who That's is the it. current defensive coordinator <laughs> for the Cincinnati Bengals. And nobody knows him, which is a bit. And they're in the final four, which tells you about the Bengals. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Lou's doing a good job for that team. Uh, Phillyboys.com, uh, Jimmy Kemsky, last question. Uh, from me involves um, sort of the draft and three first round picks. If I had to pin you down, obviously not players, positions. Yeah. Edge rusher, corner, quarterback. Do they start? You know, just because people say Kenny Pickett isn't worthy of being the top five. Well, we're talking about 15, 16, sure. 19 now. What do you think the Eagles' early thoughts are? Well, if they use all three of those picks, I'd be shocked if one of them wasn't yeah. an edge rusher. Shocked. So uh, that's number one on my list. It's clear that they need help there and and not even just a starter, but also depth at that position. So that's number one for me. And then, you know, at quarterback, hey, <laughs> like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So some, some people don't think that this is a, a quality quarterback draft. There might be four guys that still go in the first round of this draft and Kenny Pickett and Matt Corral. Uh, Malik Willis has a chance to go round one. Sam Howell has a chance to go round one. So there, there are going to be teams that like these quarterbacks more than, you know, maybe me, you or the average Joe fan. Some of these guys are going to get taken like early, like maybe even like Kenny Pickett might go top 10 for all we know. A couple guys might go uh, in the teens for all we know. And you look at draft history, like Deshaun Watson went what, like 10th? Patrick yeah. Mahomes went right around there as well. So you have these guys that, you know, maybe weren't thought of as, um, you know, like Andrew Luck type prospects coming out of college, but they had certain traits and those traits translated to the NFL and they became, you know, really good NFL players. So, yeah, I wouldn't completely rule out that they take a quarterback and with one of those three picks. Uh, maybe a little bit of a surprise that if, if you know, that if, if they saw it so much differently than the rest of the league, I think if the Eagles really liked a quarterback, they'd try to move up and get them as opposed to just sitting there at 15, 16, 19 and hoping that they get back to them. Uh, but yeah, I, I could certainly see that. But again, for me, if they keep those three perks picks, there's no way that they're not taking at least one edge rusher with those picks. All right, Jimmy, I'm going to stick with the draft and I'm going to let you do what you do. All you guys do, which is evaluate. You need to evaluate me. Here's what I mean. Uh, we get to the draft in uh, April, and a lot of people have espoused the theory. And I completely follow the mindset and the thinking of it. The Eagles will probably trade one of those three picks into 2023 so that they've got a little bit more of a balance to this year, to next year. If they need a quarterback, nice to have that bullet and that asset to be able to use it, blah, blah, blah. But I did the research, and that very rarely happens. The teams trade a pick in this year yeah. for a pick a year down the road. <laughs> Usually you want to trade down, you can trade down, but you move up in another round, you add picks for this year's draft. Just say, yeah, go ahead, take our pick. We'll get back to it next year. That doesn't happen often. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying there's not a great track record of it. Easier said than done. Am I overthinking this or is this a legit concern? Uh, yeah, so way easier said than done. Um, I think that you don't see it that much because those offers don't come around that often. Like the best thing that Howie did this last draft was move back from six to 12 and pick up the extra first round pick this year. Like that was, I mean, that was out, like an outstanding deal, kind of a dumb deal in my opinion from the Dolphins perspective. And I think Howie was right to snap that up and he did. And now they have, 
you know, an extra first round pick this year, in addition to landing Devonte Smith, by the way. So, you know, if that opportunity presents itself in this draft, yeah, he's going to jump all over. That. I think how he's actually asked that directly in the, in the year end press conference, whether he'd be open to trading to a, uh, for, for, uh, you know, 2023 first round pick. And he, he was basically like, yeah, yeah, I do that. So uh, yeah, I think they'd be more than interested to, to move one of these picks for, I mean, you would, you wouldn't even just move a pick for a pick next year. You trade back and you get a pick in 2022 and then you'd get the extra pick in 2023 as well as sort of the mechanics of how that would work. Uh, but yeah, they, they'd be more than interested in, in doing that w- without question. But like you said, easier said than done because you have to have a, a, a team that's willing to move up uh, to, to one of your picks at 15, 16, 19, whatever it may be. And, um, you know, I, the likelihood of that happening is probably a little lower in a quarterback draft that's maybe not as well thought of as, as other years. Uh, it's you, You're probably not going to find, like, sort of the blue, tri- the blue chip prospect at 15, 16, 19, whatever it is, that's worthy of giving up a, p- a first-round pick next year to go up and get. So, yeah, I, I think that's probably – uh, a wishful thinking kind of scenario. I wouldn't rule it out because they'll jump on that if they have that opportunity, but more than likely they're not going to like that offer isn't coming down the pike. And from the doomsday position, you know, what's going to happen. They're going to trade the pick. A quarterback's going to be taken there. He's going to become the next Josh <laughs> Allen. And right. then Eagle fans can go crazy about it for the next decade. Uh, Jimmy, great stuff. Always a pleasure. My friend, you know, we're going to get you on plenty during the off season. Thanks for hopping on with us today. Yeah. Appreciate it guys. Thanks, Jimmy Kempsky from Philly Voice here with us on Birds 365. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. Did Jimmy not freeze up on your end? No, he was Gentlemen? fine on my end. Okay, uh, for some reason, he things, was just yeah. stone cold frozen. That's why I, I apologize if I interrupted Jimmy and stepped on his toes because I was getting nothing. I thought yeah. we were just in a complete freak out. It's a live world of streaming. It's happened to me in the past where you can hear people, they, I, they totally freeze on my end. Yeah, Man. I I thought Jimmy was said uh, absolutely off the show, and uh, glad to know that uh, we didn't panic. I panicked, but uh, Xander and Johnny Mac didn't panic, nor did Jimmy Kemsky. So thank you guys. All right, uh, we got plenty of shows still to go here. We got an hour down, but we got an hour left to play. Come back, do more on the birds and the NFL playoffs on Birds Three Sixty Five. <laughs> 